Thank you very much, Todsy. Thank you, team. Appreciate you, you did a brilliant job. Well, it's my huge honor and privilege to speak the word of God to you tonight. Wherever you may find yourself, maybe you're sitting on your own, maybe you're with a couple of other people, maybe you're in Australia, maybe you're in another part of the world, but I believe this message is going to help you, inspire you, encourage you. What on earth do you do when the world is facing such an extraordinary crisis? What do you do when your health is at risk? Or maybe your job is at risk, or maybe your well-being? You know, a lot of people, what they do in these circumstances is look forward with desperation, sadly often without hope. But sometimes looking forward doesn't help. If we spend our life in the future without the grace of today, that is a recipe for anxiety. I would like to suggest looking forward, saying, when is this going to end? Or when are they going to find a cure? Or when are they going to find a vaccine? Sometimes is the wrong way to approach it. Perhaps it's better to look back. And that's where the Bible comes in. Because history is a great predictor of what will happen in the future. The world has faced all sorts of challenges, plagues, persecutions, crises. And I think the Bible has a huge amount to tell us about the wisdom we need to face a crisis. I'm believing that by the end of this message, you're going to have some positive and some practical guidelines on how you can apply biblical principles to your situation. And I know we're all in the same boat, we're all connecting across a link, but these eternal principles work to all people, in all places, in all situations. So let's pray and ask God to really speak to us through this message in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you for all the people who are listening online. Thank you for all the people that are connecting in their different circumstances and different situations. You know their story, you know their journey. I pray that there may be a word, a sentence, an idea, a concept in this message that's gonna speak right into the heart of every person in the precious and the most wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. I can hear the amens coming from all over the world. In AD 70, Jerusalem, which had been threatened by the Romans for so many years, was finally besieged and defeated and destroyed. The Jews that had been safe in Jerusalem were scattered throughout the world. It's called the Diaspora. And if you're taking notes, and I encourage you to check out your Bible and take notes on your phone or on a piece of paper, call this message the diaspora, things not to do. The diaspora means the scattered ones, and the Jews were scattered throughout the world until there were communities in Spain, in France, in Poland, in Russia, Scattered, not just for a few years, not just for a few months as we are being scattered, but for generations. Until in May 1948, the state of Israel was declared again and the diaspora returned. What an amazing miracle. A miracle of unity after nearly 1900 years. If my maths is correct, 1878 years since the diaspora, it returned. How on earth did that miracle take place? I would like to suggest three principles that are going to help us in this time as we are disconnected by space, but connected through technology. Three things that the Jews did. Number one, they held on to their creed. Deuteronomy chapter six and verse four. 
establishes their Shema, their creed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. They were told to impress this message on their children. So firstly, they held on to their creed. Secondly, they maintained their language. Even after nearly 1900 years, they returned, not just speaking po Polish or Russian or French or Spanish, they returned speaking Hebrew because they never forgot their word. They never forgot their heritage. In fact, Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 23 and 24 establishes the challenge when we fail to speak our language. When the Jews in exile, as they were scattered, failed to pass on the language of Judah to their children, their heritage, their language, and their faith dissipated. But when they maintained their language, it continued. Can I suggest the language of Judah for us is the language of praise. We must not forget our creed to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves, or indeed our language of praise in this challenging time. And then the third thing they did in Daniel chapter two and verse 16, we find Daniel in exile on his own, praying in his house as many of you are doing. And yet when the crisis came, he gathered his three friends together, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He stayed in community. Three fundamental principles that can help, him, that help us in this time. Firstly, don't forget your creed, to love God and to love your neighbor. Don't forget your language, the language of praise. And don't forget to stay connected in community as you're doing now over this link. When we look at the history of Israel, the Bible says everything that happened to them is a pattern for us. Their journey, if you will, was one of exodus or exile and exodus, of scattering and gathering. They were constantly being sent out and returning, sent out and returning. In a sense, the history of Israel is the history of harvest. We sow and we reap. The Bible says we sow in tears, but we reap with joy. In other words, there's pain in the scattering, even as there is pain in this time, but there is always joy in the regathering. There is joy in the returning. There is joy when the scattered people of God return. In fact, I would like to say that even though this scattering may continue for a few weeks, a few months even, when the church returns and regathers, because God always turns a threat to opportunity, it will return with greater strength, greater diversity, greater fruitfulness. In fact, maybe this threat is actually an opportunity for us to be scattered into the marketplace where we can be salt and light in the world. This gathering and scattering is actually a normal part of church life. Luke chapter nine and verse one, the Bible says Jesus gathered his disciples to him and then sent them out. There was a coming in and a going out. Even in Acts chapter one and verse six, the same thing happened. He gathered the people together in community and then sent them out to make a difference in the world. In fact, verse eight of that same passage in Acts chapter one says that God is gonna give us the spirit of God where we're gonna be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But notice the pattern. He gathered us in and he sent us out. Normally we gather in community on Sundays and then are sent out to the marketplace on a Monday morning. But in this situation, we've been gathered normally, but we're being sent out into the world to make a difference and to bring the hope of Jesus Christ to a hopeless world and the answers from the Bible to people in your world that perhaps don't know their answers. The truth is that even when this is done by default, in other words, it was forced on the church, it still benefited them. 
In Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, a massive persecution came against the church in Jerusalem. Up to that point, from chapters 1 to 7, they hadn't even filled, they hadn't even uh, moved on into their um, commission to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But in Acts chapter 8, this persecution scattered them. It said they were scattered to, Jeruz uh, scattered to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And what happened when they returned, as they did in Acts chapter 13 and verse 1, in the story of the church of Antioch, they returned better, stronger, bigger, more diverse, more influential. I'm honestly believing that God is going to turn this horrendous, painful, challenging situation to our benefit. God always turns around things for our good. That's the nature of God. But we need to learn some principles, fundamental principles, as we go into this season. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus makes an astounding statement. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, but you will always receive peace in me. What a glorious, what a glorious promise. He says, don't worry, don't panic. I have overcome the world. Here are three generic principles to bear in mind as maybe you're sitting on your own thinking, what do I do now? Well, what did Jesus say in that verse in John 16, verse 33? Firstly, he says, you will have trouble. We need to face the facts. If you're people of faith, we need to be pragmatic about our circumstances. We will face challenges. We will face difficulties. Jesus didn't say everything's going to be honey and roses. He didn't say it was all going to be easy. We're going to have to face facts. But can I just encourage you? When we face facts, we don't need to lose our faith. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 18, the Bible says that Abraham and Sarah, who couldn't have children, it says, against all hope, in hope they believed. And then in verse 19, it says, they faced the facts that their body was as good as dead, and yet they did not waver regarding the promise of God, but were fully persuaded that God had the ability to do what he said he would do. Let's face the facts of the challenges and the problems and pray like crazy, but don't lose hope. God is still on the throne. The second thing that we learn from John chapter 16 and verse 33 is that we need to praise his name. He said, there's always peace in me, always opportunity for us to find God in the middle of a crisis. The Bible actually says in Proverbs that his name is like a strong tower into which the righteous run and are safe. I don't know about you, but that's where I'm going in these next few weeks. I'm going to find my refuge in the name of God. Listen to this in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 17. It says some fantastic words of encouragement. Listen to this. Uh, Though the fig tree doesn't bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. I don't know where you are. Maybe you're in another country, but in Australia. If you go to the supermarkets, because sadly, the, selfish, the selfishness of so many people, they have stripped the supermarkets of meat, of necessities, even toilet paper is impossible to find. And tragically, even some medicines are difficult to find. So if you translate this verse, this chapter, into our current situation, it might say this, though there is no toilet paper on the shelves, though there is no medicine to find, though there is no meat for your meal, yet I will 
rejoice in God my Savior. I will be joyful despite the circumstances. I know that's a tall order, but nonetheless, that's what Jesus encourages us with. So, firstly, face the facts. Secondly, praise his name. Thirdly, confess his promises. There's always the promise of God. The Bible says, you will have peace in me. Jesus said, don't worry, I've overcome the world. Psalm 91, our senior pastor, Brian Houston, has been quoting this over the last few weeks, and it's a wonderful verse to reiterate, perhaps write it down on a piece of paper and, and, uh, or on your phone and take it with you wherever you go and repeat it. What does it say? It says in verse five, you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. Listen to this, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. What an amazing statement. If you're a person of faith, you face the facts, you're pragmatic about the circumstances, but you praise God in your circumstances and you proclaim the promise of God over your circumstances. But there's more wisdom that we find in the Bible. After the church had been persecuted in Jerusalem and been scattered into the community to be light and salt in the world, James, the brother of Jesus, who had every reason to despair because he'd seen his own brother crucified and had every reason to doubt because he was the bishop of Jerusalem where the persecution was at its heaviest and from which his brothers and sisters had been scattered. James writes a letter to the scattered people of God. In fact, it says in James chapter one and verse one, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. The Greek word is diaspora, the scattered ones. James is actually writing to us right now, 2,000 years later, in our workplaces, in our communities, in our living rooms right now. In fact, in this time, however long it lasts, of self-exclusion, may I just encourage you to read the book of James? That's what I'm doing. But in the first few verses of the book of James, in fact, the first 18 verses, it's divided into five paragraphs. And I would like to suggest there are five pieces of wisdom that we can take into this coming week and into these coming weeks. What did James tell us? Well, listen, number one, he says, don't disconnect. James chapter one and verse one, here is James writing to everybody. Here's a situation we can easily, especially when you're living on your own, feel disconnected, but this technology allows us to be connected wherever you are. And can I just encourage you, this is the time to literally write letters, write emails, join each other on WhatsApp, talk to your friends, FaceTime people. One of the things that we're doing this weekend is that our family is gathering over a meal in four different houses and two different nations. Don't disconnect. That's what James' advice is, is. Secondly, don't despair. James chapter one and verse two says, listen to this. He says, count it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. I know that may seem impossible, but when you're listening to the news, but maybe you should listen to the news a little less. Take all the practical advice you, you need, but don't despair. It is so easy to give up hope in these situations, but God is a God of hope. In Romans and 15, it says, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says in Romans chapter 15 and verse four, through the encouragement of the scriptures, we will have hope. Joy and or perseverance in trial promises us blessing promises us a crown of life. In, our, in, in fact, each of these five simple ideas comes with a promise. Read them through for yourself. So don't disconnect, don't despair. Thirdly, don't doubt. 
James says, when you're praying, don't just hope that something will happen. If you're praying for wisdom, he says, receive wisdom. In other words, pray with gratitude, pray with thanksgiving, pray with faith. He says, don't be double-minded. When you're receiving lots of different reports, it's very easy to be double-minded, but don't do that. James is telling us some simple advice, practical advice. Fourth paragraph, fourth point, don't discriminate. James chapter one, verses nine to 11 says, the crisis is a great leveler. The rich are on the same level as the poor. The poor are at the same level as the rich. We're all in this together. I'm sure many of you are watching in Australia, but those outside of Australia may have been watching what has happened in Australia at the beginning of the year, the bushfires. We saw a community come together shoulder to shoulder against the threat. We all saw it as a common enemy. But the tragedy about the virus is that when we see each other, we think of each other as a threat. And instead of being shoulder to shoulder against a threat, we're facing each other and thinking others are a, are a threat. Can I suggest you don't discriminate? Don't discriminate about people you think are threatening your security. Don't discriminate about the older or the younger. This may be an opportunity, in fact, for you to look out for the people in your world who desperately need help. And the final piece of advice from James is don't be deceived. It says God, God is the giver of gifts. We can blame everybody in a crisis like this. We can blame, we can blame God. We can blame Satan. Well, he may be involved, but blaming him doesn't help. As I heard someone say, the only real person that did all this is Adam and Eve. They were, as someone described, the original idiots. But even blaming Adam and Eve isn't gonna help us. Don't blame the people in your world or where this virus came from. We're all in this together, and we are gonna stand shoulder to shoulder against it. Don't be deceived in this time. Matthew chapter 16, and with this verse I'll finish before I pray. Matthew 16 and verse 18 and 19, Jesus said this, and I just want to encourage you. Jesus said this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But then he goes on to talk to Peter, but I've given you the keys of the kingdom. Can I suggest that even though God is the one that's gonna bring hope and faith and healing and change to this crisis, we have a part to play. Follow James's advice, follow Jesus' advice and believe that we're gonna to come together again, stronger, more diverse and more blessed than ever before. Now, before you go and before I hand back to Peter, can I just say this? What does it mean to have peace with God? In a time of anxiety, we need to know that we've got peace with God. Maybe you're listening to this and you don't have peace with God. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came to reconcile us to God in heaven so that he won't be a distant God, but he will be a God inside of our lives by his spirit. He said, I've come to give you reconciliation. I've come to bring you peace. I wonder if you know that peace in your life. You can. All you've got to do is to invite the Lord Jesus Christ into your life. And when he comes in, he forgives you. When he comes in, he gives you purpose. Would you like to pray with me as I pray with you across this link and invite Jesus Christ into your life? Come on, why don't you, wherever you are, just say this prayer together with me. Oh Lord Jesus Christ, tonight I realize I need you. Please come into my life and change me forever. Do what you said you would do. Clean up my life. Give me purpose. Even in this traumatic crisis, may you be my peace. From now on, Jesus, I put you in charge of my life. You are now my King, my Lord, and my Savior. Amen. Father God, I pray for all these people who prayed that prayer and everyone listening. 
May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guide them and keep them in this time, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Peter.